This is CBC Here and Now. The number of COVID-19 cases remain low in each of the four Atlantic provinces, so a decision was made to create an Atlantic bubble. Opening up to Atlantic Canada, the government is lifting travel restrictions within the region next Friday, allowing people to cross borders without the need to self-isolate. Sadness really set in and I remember just sitting in my closet just crying. We just realized that there was no such a thing and we were pretty much being scammed. Dozens across Canada say they've been scammed out of hundreds of dollars by a woman from this province. It's hot, hot, hot. I'll tell you how long it's going to last. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Some big news announced today during the provincial COVID-19 briefing. Newfoundland and Labrador will be joining the Atlantic bubble on July 3rd with plans to open up to the rest of the country later in the month. Also, Alert Level 2 starts tomorrow. Here and Now's Meg Roberts joins us live with more. So Meg, let's start with the Atlantic bubble. What did you learn about that today? Well, the Atlantic bubble means we can go to Atlantic provinces and Maritimers can come here without having to self isolate for two weeks. Now, this is a real departure from what the premier said earlier this month, which was Newfoundland and Labrador wasn't ready. He said that they're not being forced into the Atlantic bubble and their top priority is safety. Now, here is what health officials had to say today. When we look at the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 in the Atlantic provinces. It's very similar to ours. Uh, most uh, provinces have had uh, very few, if any, cases uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks, for sure. And, uh, and I think, you know, we, we can safely um, travel back and forth uh, between the other Atlantic provinces and Newfoundland and Labrador. The Premier also announced today that the province will open up to uh, other Canadians as of July 17th, but that date is subject to change. It'll depend on a number of factors, including how merging with Atlantic provinces, like PEI, works out. They're going to do assessments on it. The Premier said today self-isolation for the rest of Canada would work like the Atlantic bubble, implying no self-isolation will be required. Now, with more traffic could come more COVID cases. Dr. Fitzgerald made it clear that we will be seeing new cases and they're working on a strategy for when that does happen. The province has the ability to reverse the alert levels, but a lot of factors would go into that decision. I think that people need to be aware and be ready that we are likely going to see cases. And it's not as simple as just, oh, if we start to see more cases that will shut down again. Uh, because I don't think there's an appetite for anybody to really go there again. But, I mean, if we have to, we will have to, but, uh, but that's not our goal. Also, Alert Level 2 starts tomorrow. That means bars, movie theaters, playground equipment, recreation centers will all be open tomorrow. Uh, you're also going to be allowed to have gatherings up to 50 people, but social distancing will be required. And uh, there also will be more medical procedures starting tomorrow. Carolyn. Thanks so much, Meg. That's here now's Meg Roberts reporting live. Today's Atlantic bubble announcement comes on the heels of last night's staycation launch. The province announced a new marketing campaign on Facebook Live late yesterday at the top of Signal Hill, encouraging Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to vacation at home and explore our province this summer. I now invite you to join me as we light our beacon of home right here behind us. The $450,000 campaign kicked off with the lighting of this sign on Cabot Tower and includes 10 weeks of online radio and television advertising. It was created before the province opened up to the Maritimes, but Premier Dwight Ball says the stay home message still rings true. Vacation is something that, of course, we're promoting here uh, as a province because given the fact that, you know, many of the hospitality, the accommodation, the tourism sector has been hit extremely hard, we've always said, first and foremost, we must demonstrate that we can move around our province safely before we open it up. And I think we've been able to, you know, provide that level of confidence. So right now it's always vacation. 
People from across Canada are sounding the alarm. They say they've been ripped off in a puppy scam, paying deposits to someone claiming to be a dog breeder. And they're all pointing the finger at one person. They believe the woman behind it is living right here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Jen White has that story for CBC Investigates. Elizabeth Halpin placed a dog wanted ad on Kijiji in February, looking for a Chinese Sharpei puppy. She got a text from a woman named Helen Pasha, a dog breeder who lived just four hours away. She sent pictures of the puppies and her Canadian Kennel Club registration. I called the CKC and it was in fact a valid certificate. I thought, okay, you know, this seems legitimate. Halpin sent a $500 deposit, but when she asked to video chat to see her new dog, radio silence. That's when the real anger and like sadness really set in. And I remember just sitting in my closet, just crying because I felt like such an idiot. Halpin started doing more research. It turns out the real Helen Pasha breeds French bulldogs in Quebec. It just really made me feel like just really stupid and embarrassed. I'm 25 with all this technology at my fingers. Days later, Halpin got another reply to her ad. Natalie Lenstra, a breeder from Kelowna, who sent along proof of her identity that sent up red flags. I found her on Facebook and she immediately told me that she had known someone had stolen her passport photo. It turns out the real Natalie Lenstra is a Pomeranian breeder in Ontario. She had sent the photos in February to a potential buyer who wanted proof of her ID. The next thing I was getting more calls with uh, screenshots of my, my personal ID being used. Um, this went on for for months. Lenstra says she has spoken to about 35 people who say they lost between $150 to $700 each. People would call me and they say, where's my dog? I've been waiting here for two hours and we drove for three and a half hours. Where's, where's my puppy? The scams continued. In May, Mary Rosjuyan and her husband were looking for a Doberman puppy. They got a reply to their online ad from a dog breeder named Brittany Osborne. She did say she had, she was living in Newfoundland before. However, she had moved to Kingston. They paid a $400 deposit and Osborne was supposed to deliver the dog the next day, but they say she never showed. We just realized that there was no such a thing and we were pretty much being scammed. All of the victims who spoke with CBC Investigates say the culprit is Brittany Osborne, a 25-year-old resident of Harbor Grace who also goes by her maiden name, Mahaney. CBC Investigates has found at least 10 different Facebook accounts that appear to be hers. Brittany Osborne has a criminal record. She was found guilty of fraud in 2014 and in 2017. She's currently facing unrelated charges of fraud, theft and extortion, and she's due in court in August. We emailed her at one of the addresses used in the scams and got a voicemail in return. Osborne told CBC Investigates that some of these pet scam allegations are true and some are false, but didn't explain further. I'm struggling from mental health addiction for a long, long time. My addiction has maybe turned to a scam. Osborne also says she has stopped doing this, but others still are, and she's being blamed. Osborne did not respond to follow-up requests for an interview. Meanwhile, the RCMP told CBC Investigates that it's looking into pet scam allegations. Police say that while no charges have yet been laid, that investigations are ongoing. Good girl. There is a happy ending to this tale for Elizabeth Halpin. She got a rescue dog, and it was the breed she had been looking for. Her name is Pork, like a pork chop. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> she's just like, she's wrinkly and she snorts. Looking back, Halpin says she should have done more research. I shouldn't have led with my excitement and my hopefulness of a puppy and the excitement of that. I should have really just led with intellect. I have no hope for my money. If I can save at least a handful of other people or stop this completely, then it's worth more than my money. Go cool pork. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the head of Central Health has resigned less than two years into her five-year term. Andre Robichaud is retiring due to a family member's health. She plans to split her time between this province and Moncton until her replacement is found. Robichaud came on in 2018 amid reports of growing instability at Central Health as well as its hostile work environment. Robichaud says it takes time to change a culture but says they've come a long way. Well, you know, in any organization, when you, you lose the uh, CEO, 
uh, your, the uncertainty sets in, you know, what will the new person be like? What kind of structure will they want? Uh, so that's, that, that is, um, uh, I'm sure questions, but I, I must say that when I look at, uh, some of the structure we put in, I think that, uh, um, we're now comparable to all other jurisdictions in Canada. And I spoke with Andre Robichaud earlier today about her resignation and the current culture at Central Health. My full conversation with her in about 20 minutes on Here and Now. Well, in other news, a two-vehicle collision caused damage at Rollins Cross today. An SUV collided with a van this morning in downtown St. John's. For nearly two years, that intersection has functioned as a roundabout. Last month, St. John's City Council voted to reinstate the traffic lights at the complicated corner. Just two days into the change, there was an accident when a sedan crashed into an iron fence. Well, as we've reported on here and now, the city is changing some streets to become to better accommodate walkers and cyclists during the pandemic. Have a look at Parade Street in downtown St. John's. Some $32,000 was spent to buy hundreds of candlestick style traffic markers. A section of the lane is being placed off limits to vehicles here. On wider roads like Elizabeth Avenue, a full lane may be set aside for safety. Sidewalks are also being widened on Newtown Road and Harbor Drive. George Street is a beehive of activity today as bars get set to open as part of Alert Level 2. But how are some of the owners feeling about the new regulations? I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. Well, I hope you like the heat because there's a lot more where that came from. Things are going to start to change as we head towards the weekend, but I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up.
This province is facing a financial, economic, and health crisis. How will the next premier lead us through it? Tune in Thursday night for a special edition of Here and Now. Watch Andrew Fury and John Abbott go head-to-head -head in a live debate. We want you to get involved. What questions do you have for the two liberal leadership contenders? Email hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca and then tune in Thursday night. Welcome back. Alert level two means bars across the province can finally reopen tomorrow. It's been a rough year for the drink slinging business in St. John's due to snowmageddon and then COVID-19. But while the drinks will be flowing, you won't be allowed to dance or sing karaoke. Bars will also be at half capacity, which isn't great news for bar owners on George Street. That's where we sent Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton to learn more. On a hot, sunny June day, George Street, well, it would normally be filled with people. Today, there are a lot of cars and trucks. All of them fixing up the bars on the street to get ready to open on Thursday as part of Alert Level 2. Now, there are a lot of restrictions and a lot of rules before they can open. And, well, not all of them are sitting well with some bar owners. Those of us who have restaurants were able to open already, so it's basically for us that arise is almost the same. There's nothing has changed except for there's more restrictions on music. There's more there's there's no dancing going to be allowed. They're asking us to keep the music a little lower than normal. I guess not to create that louder atmosphere. Um, but some bars, like uh, my friends uh, at the karaoke cops, I mean, they're not allowing karaoke, which I think is just unfair. Um, you know, if a musician can get on stage and sing. I don't see why they can't have that. Uh, there's proper co protocols they can put in place, like sanitizing mics or you know having several mics so they can rotate the mics out and clean them in between use. We need to open because we're bleeding slowly to death here. Um, you know we were closed for three months plus, uh, having to pay our overhead with no revenues, and uh, you know we're at 50% capacity if we can get that, depending on the size and the layout of your business. Not everybody can achieve that. To just be told that you can't operate, I can, I can only imagine how devastating that is to them, because we're not making money being opened anyway. But at least it's slowing the bleed down a little bit. But we're still not making money. I mean, we're we're open losing money. I think mainly the two predominant messages are opening the Atlantic Canadian bubble when we don't have our own economic house in order, that's a moment, and further to that, double the staff to help take care of half the capacity is an economic conundrum that anyone in business can relate to. I think it's sad that uh, some of our establishment members are in a position where they're feeling like uh, opening up is something that they have to triple think about the actual benefit of doing so. I think in the short term, as staycations become more and more of a thing across the province, George Street, which on an informal survey is always ranked in the top three things people think about here and away when St. John's comes up, we have a responsibility to continue to offer the amenities and the cultural installation that this entertainment district has provided for years. And I think it's really important for all of us to feel a part of that conversation, but not just on the street, on behalf of all entertainment related service and event venue providers across the province. I think we're all singing the same tune. Oh, Roddy's and Yellow Belly open up on around June the 8th, actually uh, June 9th for Yellow Belly and that Friday for O'Reilly's. Um, and we open our patio too where we're standing today. Um, it's, you know, that, that first weekend was sort of like a honeymoon. It was, it was pretty good. I mean, we're at 50% capacity, um, you know, and all the COVID protocols and stuff. So that's, uh, you know, while necessary, challenging, of course, right? Not, not easy. And of course, staff are wearing masks and, and uh, that's hard to wear when you're, when you're at work and especially in a warm day and in a warm environment and, and a busy environment like restaurants are. Um, but uh, it started, to, you know, it's after dwindling off a bit uh, since we first opened. Of course, we're only left with the locals to support us, which we're thankful that they're coming out to support us. But, uh, you know, with no tourists, we're just, our businesses aren't built on, you know, for the summer months, they're built on, on tourists, right? They're nervous. It's a nervous situation for them. They've been closed for months. Don't, let's not forget they got hit with snowmageddon as well. I was just down the road speaking to one of the, a bar owner that owns many bars and restaurants downtown. He's very nervous. He's very concerned. The regulations are strict and they're, they're wondering how they're going to survive. So I've been here to con continuously uh, encourage people to come downtown, to put their feet where their mouths are. They're saying they're coming down, they'll come down and support them. Because there's never been a time in, in history that down Saint John's, uh, downtown St. John's has needed people so much. They need to support more now than they ever, ever did.
Weather update is brought to you by the sold-out HCF Home Lottery. Thank you, Newfoundland and Labrador. Your support has been overwhelming. Prize winners will be announced on June 25th at hcfhomelottery.ca. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast, and what a day out there. Where are you right now? <laughs> It looks like I am on a tropical beach, but uh, I'm in Middle Cove Beach. Where else do you want to go when it is a, a hot summer day, but uh, hang out at the beach? Lots of people down here today enjoying this heat and humidity yet again. And, uh, you know, it's really the story across the board. Let's take a look at those temperatures uh, for the province. A number of areas reaching the 28, 29 degree range. And the first place to reach the 30 degree mark was uh, Deer Lake and Corner Brook this afternoon. 30 and 31 degrees was your afternoon high. And then we've got temperatures in Twilling Gate again, 28 degrees. Now we do have uh, lots of humidity in play as well, feeling closer to 34 to 36 in Deer Lake. So this uh, heat and humidity isn't really going anywhere uh, for at least another day or so. Still have that heat warning expanded towards uh, to include now Clarenville and Bonavista, but hasn't quite reached that criteria just yet. But it is still hot nonetheless. And with those warm temperatures on the west coast, uh, anglers are saying that the heat is really affecting the water levels there. So certainly, uh, hopefully going to see some of this warmer air uh, move away and some rain move in just to help that there. So as far as what we've got weather wise, we've got an area of low pressure to the north, a stationary front in behind that, and that is sparking some thunderstorms for uh, most of the big land, at least south right now of um, Happy Valley Goose Bay as well as Lab City. And then we've got uh, the remnants of tropical storm or tropical cyclone rather, Dolly and that's bringing in some cloud cover in eastern areas. We are starting to see that clear out now though with plenty of sunshine expected for the next few hours with a few peaks of sun in the mix as well. But overall a pretty carbon copy forecast from last night with that area of fog and drizzle along the south coast. Some thunderstorm potential for Lab City uh, and really anywhere in Lab West and then just some showers will move through along that stationary front and pretty much continue through the first half of tomorrow as well. So overnight, your temperatures again, another mild night, 16 to 19 degrees. Those winds light on the west coast. In eastern areas, a little breezy, southwesterlies 15 to 20 kilometers per hour, and then dipping into those single digits along coastal Labrador, three degrees will be the overnight low in Maine. Heading through the day tomorrow, that heat and humidity will stick around. Should be a little bit more sunshine in play, but along the south coast, again, a carbon copy forecast, looking at uh, the fog and drizzle and cooler temperatures continuing with some showers for the northern peninsula as well as most of Labrador tomorrow afternoon. And then as we head into the late day, uh, into the evening and overnight, we'll see some showers develop along the west coast and then head towards central towards the early morning hours. So here's your temperatures, a little bit cooler for St. John's by one or two degrees, 25 degrees, but another beautiful, hot, humid day through central. And at Corner Brook, another 30 degree day. Going to keep that potential in for some thunderstorms for Lab City at 22 degrees. And then as we head into Friday, we'll start to see those heat warnings drop off, probably for the West Coast, hanging on to them through parts of Central and the interior. 24 to 28 degrees, it looks like. Uh, up through Labrador, staying unsettled with 11 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay and 5 for Nain. Now, as we head through the weekend, by Sunday, it looks like things will start to get a little bit more unsettled, dropping down to the teens, still mild, but uh, back down to the teens. So we'll get rid of uh, some of this humidity that we're seeing. Central Newfoundland uh, by Saturday, 22 degrees, and then a little bit of a dip with uh, those gray skies and showers. For Western Newfoundland, there's some showers on tap for Saturday. Sunday looks dry at this point. Might see a few scattered showers, but uh, generally cloudy and then 19 degrees for your Monday. For Eastern Labrador, cool until we get to the end of the weekend when those temperatures start to jump up. And then same thing for Western Labrador by Monday, you'll see a temperature near 22 degrees with the return of the sunshine. Had to share this great shot of the sea arch in Tickle Cove. Thank you so much to Barry for sending that lovely shot in. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, that is gorgeous. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Ashley.
Well, Ashley mentioned those low water levels on the West Coast, and you may have noticed that my co-host Anthony Germain has been off this week. Well, he's staycationing on the West Coast of the island right now and has agreed to speak with me, provided I don't reveal which Salmon River he's on right now. So, Anthony, it looks absolutely stunning out there. What's the weather been like? Oh, you know, it's funny when you, when you work in St. John's, you're on that West Coast, the West Coast, you kind of dismiss it, but wow, it's fantastic. However, uh, there's no question, just in the last three days, you can actually see where, if you're actually going around Salmon Rivers on the West Coast, in the Codroy Valley from Cornerbrook West, it's um, no question, you can see that actually the water level's going down, it's really, really hot. It's fantastic on the one side, but if you're an angler, you kind of, kind of look, the fish are not really moving when the, when the water is low, but the rivers are really, really low even for this time of June. Beautiful weather, great weather, but no question the rivers are pretty, pretty low and it's fantastic out here. How do you think those low water levels are going to affect people who want to head out and go salmon fishing? Well, I think most, like for the anglers, you know, the diehards, they're all, you know, they're all trying to get their fish and all that kind of stuff. But I, I guess the question is going to be if DFO decides really early on, is it time to actually close some of the rivers? Because, because you know, and with the COVID-19, people are sort of thinking, and, and the, the, with the recommendations that angling is a safe outdoor sport, everything's fine, but it's really, really hot and the water's really, really low. So I think people are trying to get in before the rivers are actually closed, because usually when things get to where they are, they, the rivers will eventually be closed. But right now, it's just people are just going out and just really enjoying, having a nice time. Yeah. All right, well, I guess lots of people will be uh, keeping an eye on those water levels, but how is the salmon fishing going for you? Fantastic. <laughs> really? <laughs> are you catching a lot of fish? <laughs> I, I, listen, it's, it, I've been embarrassingly successful and I will torture people on social media at the appropriate time. It's amazing. <laughs> well, Anthony, I'm so glad uh, you're being successful with your, your fishing and that you're having a lot it only of... Took, it only took seven years, Carolyn. <laughs> well, it's your year this year. <laughs> it is. All right. Well, have fun out there on the river. Uh, tight lines to you. Thank you, my dear. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right, off we go now. <laughs> Bye.
Welcome back. As you heard earlier in the show, the CEO of Central Health has resigned. Andre Robichaud was less than two years into a five-year contract with the health authority. For years, the organization has been plagued with complaints and conflicts between management and staff about a culture of workplace bullying and harassment. There have been reviews and reports, and two years ago, Robichaud was hired to make changes and shake things up. I spoke with her this afternoon. So Ms. Robichaud, why have you decided to step down as head of Central Health? So uh, I have a, a member of my family that uh, is not well and wants to return uh, home. We own a home in Moncton. And uh, therefore, um, we made a decision that uh, for everybody concerned, I need some support and I have some family in Moncton. So we're returning to Moncton. I've assured the board that I will keep uh, working as CEO. I'm going to return to Moncton. I'll come back two weeks here and two weeks from home. And I've assured them that uh, I will actually um, uh, keep supporting them until they find a replacement. And, and sorry to hear about uh, your family member who's who's not well. I, I know it's been quite a, a tumultuous time during your tenure at Central Health. We've reported extensively on uh, Central Health's toxic work environment, and that's not a word that I use. That was in the findings in the Vaughn report. You know, it described a culture of bullying and harassment at the Gander Hospital. Did that play any role in your decision to leave? No, I would suggest that um, in the past, it would have been two years in October that I've been here. I would uh, suggest that um, we've uh, moved quite a bit away from that. Now, um, the culture takes time. So I think we've, we've built a, a great team. They were all great people. I think it was uh, a lack of process and a lack of process usually uh, results in people um, not getting along and what, what I don't like the word toxic, but uh, it, it leads to that. So I think that we've put in a lot of processes in the last um, year and a half that will help the organization move forward because at the end of the day, we have wonderful staff at Central Health. And I think that's, if there's one thing that I want to reassure the public is that uh, the team that, uh, uh, you, that you have serving the population of Central Health are committed and uh, they really are great people. We've been hearing radiologists complaining about the culture in Central Health for years, and, and you say that some progress has been made since you've been there, but it was only just last week that we heard from Dr. Jane Rendell, a radiologist with Central Health, uh, who says that you know she's been on leave since September, but she wants to work. She was complaining that during the pandemic, Central Health has been flying in doctors from out of country to do the job that she can do. Uh, what, what do you say about that, that there are still complaints that are happening? So uh, when you have uh, 3,500 employees, you'll always have complaints. I don't think that uh, you judge an, uh, an organization uh, based on one, two, or three, or four, or five people. It's truly about uh, how the, the core uh, and the group feel. And I think with uh, the engagement of the staff, we're putting in uh, structures that um, will actually um, bring them to um, better outcomes. How would you describe the culture in there right now? You talk about the changes in processes, but uh, what about the overall tone, uh, the, the relationships, the overall culture uh, in central health right now? How would you describe that? So that's a, 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 I would think we've improved uh, considerably. We're still doing some changes um, at the uh, management level. So there's a lot, still a lot of uncertainty. And I'm sure that this announcement, all right, will kind of uh, destabilize. Why do you think that uh, your departure will destabilize? In any organization, when you, you lose the uh, CEO, uh, your the uncertainty sets in. You know, what will the new person be like? What kind of structure will they want? How would you respond to those who say that central health uh, punishes employees who speak out against it? I would think that's totally unfair uh, because you uh, don't see eye to eye uh, with some of the policies or procedures that um, uh, we have. Uh, you feel that you have grievances with uh, the organization is fair, but to label the organization and to make uh, accusations, that's, uh, that is a dangerous uh, avenue. 
Would you have any final words for the radiologists that spoke out yes. against the leadership at Central Health? So hopefully we will find a way forward and we will be able to, to move to a place where um, they can come back to work and uh, work within a system uh, within the rules and the procedures that uh, uh, Central Health has set up uh, through their bylaws. Well, Ms. Robichaud, thank you so much for speaking with me today and uh, good luck going forward. Thank you very much and have a great day. You too. Turning now to some international news, German pharmaceutical company Bayer has reached a multi-billion dollar settlement. This in response to tens of thousands of cancer-related lawsuits over its Roundup herbicide. Roundup was created by U.S. agrochemical company Monsanto in the 70s. Bayer bought them out in 2018, long after Roundup had become one of the world's most widely used weed killers. As early as the 90s, there were concerns about cancer in those who had high exposure to the chemical. Today's settlement could resolve 95,000 lawsuits in the states, close to 11 billion U.S. dollars. The company says it will continue selling the herbicide and will not add a cancer warning label. That settlement still needs the approval of the U.S. court. Well, the global pandemic has hit airlines like WestJet hard. The, the carrier says its industry is facing devastating losses. Now the company is cutting a quarter of its staff. The changes will see the company consolidate all call center activity in Alberta. It will also restructure its office and management staff. More than 3,300 employees across the country will be affected. WestJet says it's releasing the majority of outside contractors and putting a hiring freeze in place. It also has cut executive salaries.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Another video has people continuing to question the use of force by police. This one shows an RCMP officer dragging a university student across the floor and stepping on her head. It happened in January in Kelowna. The video is now part of a civil lawsuit against the Mountie. CBC's Brady Strachan reports, but first a warning. Some may find the content disturbing. This is the video that has Kelowna and the rest of the country talking and questioning police officers' involvement in wellness checks. The incident happened here at this apartment building for UBC Okanagan students. It involved Corporal Lacey Browning and a nursing student, 20-year-old Mona Wang. It resulted in Browning dragging Wang across the building's lobby in front of other students and then stepping on her head. Actions all caught on surveillance cameras. In a civil lawsuit, Wang says she was in mental distress and her boyfriend called the RCMP to check in on her. Wang claims Browning found her lying in a semi-conscious state in her bathroom. But instead of providing help, she says the officer yelled at her to get up and kicked her in the stomach when she didn't. The surveillance video shows Browning pulling Wang, who is lying on her stomach and not moving, down a carpeted hallway and later into the lobby. Wang is handcuffed and only wearing pants and a bra. As other students come and go, some stopping to stare at her lying on the ground. When Wang lifts her head slightly, Browning forces it back down to the floor with her foot. None of the claims in the lawsuit have been proven in court. However, the video comes in the wake of another disturbing arrest video for the Kelowna RCMP, where an officer punches a suspect repeatedly in the head. And it's also on the heels of other incidents involving police and wellness checks in Canada, including cases that resulted in deaths in New Brunswick and Ontario. Here in Kelowna, Mayor Colin Bazran says what he saw when he watched this recent arrest video is disappointing. It, you know, really disturbing. And I think it just uh, highlights the need for systemic changes. You know, obviously dealing with uh, mental health and uh, addiction issues is not easy. But what I saw in that video was incredibly disappointing. In a legal response, Corporal Browning says Wang was combative and she only used enough force to take her into custody under the Mental Health Act. An RCMP spokesperson says it's reviewing the video and the allegations and will determine the next steps to take. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna. Well, there's some vindication today for an Alberta Indigenous leader whose violent arrest was recorded on video. All charges against Chief Alan Adam have been dropped. After his court appearance, Adam said racism was clearly a factor in his case. We are criminals by our skin color. And that has to stop. Chief Adam was stopped outside a casino in Fort McMurray, Alberta in March for having expired license plates. Dash cam video released this month showed an RCMP officer suddenly tackling, then punching him. Adam was charged with resisting arrest and assaulting an officer. Today, he said police in Canada need to be reviewed starting at the very top of the RCMP. He called on individual officers to speak out when they see other police doing wrong. And he's asking for the creation of a national indigenous police force to replace the Mounties on all First Nations territory. Well, in other news, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights continues to deal with the fallout from censoring LGBT content at the request of some guests. The museum's CEO has announced he won't seek reappointment. Former Winnipeg Mayor Glenn Murray has stepped down from the museum's fundraising arm in protest, and now negotiations for a special LGBT exhibit at the museum have been suspended. CBC's Austin Gravish has the latest. The museum has been in talks with the LGBT Purge Fund about creating a permanent exhibit here. It would recognize the gay purge that happened against federal employees. But now the talks are on hold and the nonprofit is demanding answers. CBC News revealed last week the museum forced employees at times to not show gay content on tours at the request of certain guests, including religious school groups. The practice was common for at least two years, and LGBT staff were forced to block content. In at least one case, a staff member from the LGBT community was asked to physically block this same-sex marriage display from a passing group. The LGBT Purge Fund is mandated to memorialize the so-called gay purge of federal employees. 
The purge saw thousands of civil servants, including Canadians in the military and the RCMP, fired from their jobs because of their sexual orientation. The fund is required by a legal settlement to create a permanent display at the museum and had been planning one that would launch in the coming years. Now it has suspended all talks with the CMHR, saying it was shocked when it learned about the censorship. In a statement saying, the allegations are very serious and must be met with an equally serious response. The museum says it respects the group's demand for answers and the desire for the museum to move beyond words. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, earlier in the show, we heard Anthony talk about water levels on the West Coast. Well, some strange geological activities are deepening in Nova Scotia. Almost all the water has disappeared from a lake about 160 kilometers north of Halifax. So what exactly is going on? Brett Ruskin went to find out. Here, just outside Oxford, Nova Scotia, this lake used to come up to around where I'm standing, but now it's almost empty. It's all because of sinkholes. When I first started coming down about a month ago, there was still water in front of us there. Amy Tizard is a geologist who studies sinkholes, but she's never seen something like this before. Yeah, this is pretty, pretty shocking, I think. Here is the lake last year, and these are infrared satellite images from this year that show the water level in March, April, May, and June. The lake has drained before, but never this far since the 70s. But why is this happening? This is a dumb question, but where's the water going? Underground. Just underground somewhere? Yeah. Experts don't know where it's going, but they do know how it's getting there. See that dark circle? That's the mouth of a sinkhole. You can even see it in this image of the lake from 1939. So it's not a new sinkhole, it's just been reactivated. Reactivated after the lake ate through another layer of underground gypsum. So this is gypsum and it's easily uh, dissolved by water. So that's part of the reason we have sinkholes here. But it's also very soft, you can see See how easy I can scrape away at it. Meanwhile, a couple of kilometers away, this. In 2018, this sinkhole opened up and swallowed trees and part of a parking lot. It's the same geological formation that caused the water to drop at the lake. And the water level dropped so quickly that freshwater mussels like these were stuck on the land. And in fact, they've become kind of a delicacy, a seafood feast for raccoons. You can see some raccoon prints here in the dried mud. And the water is still dropping. So in the last month or so, the water has receded beyond that log. And we know that last fall, the water was up to the tree line. So where we're standing, we would be beneath the water. We would be underwater. Yeah. Wow. Now, locals and officials are worried about people coming down to take a closer look at the lake. There are already ATV tracks ripping through the lake bed. There are some sensitive areas, including some environmental studies that are underway. As for the future of this lake, it's not yet known if the water level will continue to drop further until there's no water left or when the water might come back. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, just outside Oxford, Nova Scotia.
This province is facing a financial, economic, and health crisis. How will the next premier lead us through it? Tune in Thursday night for a special edition of Here and Now. Watch Andrew Fury and John Abbott go head to head in a live debate. We want you to get involved. What questions do you have for the two liberal leadership contenders? Email hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca and then tune in Thursday night. Welcome back to Here and Now. Lori McCarthy's company Cod Sounds is all about sharing our province's culture through food. And during this pandemic, she's been sharing her skills. As part of an ongoing series, Lori's ha Lori has opened up her kitchen and tonight she's making moose. Hey everyone, um, back in the workshop today, a cup of tea on the go. The blaze orange uh, tea cozy happening. Blaze orange because we're talking about moose. Uh, yeah, so I know we're far away from moose season, but we've all just put our licenses in. And uh, I'm looking back in the freezer now at the stash and going, what do I have left? What am I going to do with it? <laughs> um, it's barbecue season. So I thought I'd pull out a few uh, piece, little pieces of tenderloin. That'll be uh, cooked off now, and we'll have that for supper later. This is uh, salt mousse. For anyone who's never made homemade salt mousse, it is absolutely delicious. You can make it in, oh, you make it in 10 days, or even seven days, really. Um, I think I got the recipe on my site, and if I don't, I'll get it up there. Let's see. That's what you want to hear. When you put goes in the pan, you want to hear a nice sizzle like that. And like I said, these are tenderloins. So I only ever cook tenderloins like medium rare, um, just because that's how we like to eat them. I think I'm gonna make a little bit of wild like salt to go on that now, rather than use regular salt. Why well, use regular salt when I can make it taste better? So these are juniper berries. Let's see what we got here now. A couple of juniper berries, never goes astray. Keep the needles out. Get caught up. Get caught up in you. <laughs> and this is sweet gale. This is a gorgeous plant. It's not out yet. You need a little bit, a little bit longer. It's only uh, um, it comes up quite early though. It won't be long now. And the little as soon as the leaves and everything else starts coming out, you'll get the leaves out on the sweet gale. So it's a bit of sweet gale in there. A bit of salt. This time of year, oh, everything's growing now. The spring of the year is so nice. So much foraging to be done. So many flavors to start preparing and, and sort of preserving and bottling up. And it's my, uh, my favorite time of the year, certainly. I think for everyone after <laughs> eight months of very little growing, that is such a time to look forward to. Let's see now. Oh yeah, there you go. You want a real nice brown on it because that's again, that's where all your flavors coming from. Back to the little salt mix. This is some dehydrated mushrooms from uh, last year. These are winter central mushrooms. So they make the best flavor on red meat especially. So I'm going to put some of them in and just pound it up a little bit. A bit of seasoning. There we go. Now all that's not salt. Mom's going, oh, there's too much salt. I can hear it now. It's not all salt. That's a bunch of herbs and stuff too. So. There you go. Oh, I smell the juniper as soon as it hits the pan. It's wicked. Red wine, because red wine should go in everything. Um, and now, you got to like your meat pretty rare to be cooking it like this. You can leave it longer, then you can take it off and put it, top, put it in the oven for a bit if you want. Lay that aside. It's all about how you like it. Look, there's no sense in cooking it if you don't like it that way. So let's see. I always like to cut my meat on the, they call it, on the bias as such, or against the grain. On the bias, that's something I heard from mom. But yeah, cut that on the bias, which basically means, yeah, on the, uh, against the grain. There you go, look. So, yep, get out the moose, get the barbecue going, now's the time. <laughs> Eat it up, so you, won't, you don't want any left when the fall comes. Um, all right, have a good one. See you later. I bet they're 
there's lots of barbecuing going on tonight in the province. Love the look of those uh, juniper, ber juniper berries, too. Well, uh, from stuffing your gob to covering your gob, as face masks become increasingly common, even mandatory in some spots, the world might seem to be uh, getting a little more impersonal. One well, entrepreneur in Belgium thinks he has the solution for that. There you go. He's uh, producing the ultimate in personalized PPE. It's your face on a mask. He converted his portable photo booths to produce images that can be ironed onto fabric masks. You can have it done right there on the spot, or you can also use the company's app and have the printed mask mailed to you. The price equals about $25 Canadian, and the image will last through eight to 10 washings. Well, that looks a little bit creepy. <laughs> well, uh, we appreciate you spending part of your evening with us. And just a reminder, Here and Now is going to look a bit different tomorrow night. For the full hour, Andrew Fury and John Abbott will be going head-to-head -head in a debate. Who will be the next leader of the Liberal Party and Premier of the province? Our Peter Cowan will be moderating that debate and hope you can join us. Good night.